On this particular evening, Rebecca Lynn was drinking from a cup of tea while looking through the window of her matrimonial room. She wasn't interested in the boulevard that stretched across her line of vision or the couple holding hands and taking a selfie. There was something about this evening that stabbed her with exquisite sadness. Her lips trembled as she took another sip of tea. She took a step back from the window blobs of tea slobbering off the top of the cup. Rebecca took a deep breath and tried to assuage the arresting aura of fear with thoughts that deepened her delusion about her situation. She stroked her long, auburn hair with her right hand and turned away from the window. She walked across the large room aimlessly. After a while, she stopped before a mirror and stared intently at her reflection. The lady in the mirror looked older, with brown lines at the bottom of her eyelids. Her brow was wrinkled and her face was stricken by the paleness of a corpse. Rebecca tried to make herself believe that the mirror wasn't really expressing her true reflection. She believed she wasn't as old as she looked and she made a lame attempt at wiping the surface of the mirror as if it would make her look better and younger. After a while, she stopped wiping the mirror without conceding to reality. Rebecca preferred to hold on to other thoughts. She thought about her husband, Richard. A feigned smile ran across her red lips, but it quickly disappeared. Rebecca thought about holding hands with him while walking across a park in college. That was the moment she believed she would be spending the rest of her life with him. When Rebecca tried to take another sip of tea, she was surprised to find that it had become cold like the thought she was unwilling to entertain. She dropped the cup on a table by the wall and rubbed her hands together, taking measured breaths as she leaned against the table. The face of a woman flashed across her mind. This woman had the smile of a monster, the stare of a freak, and Rebecca reeled backward until she dropped down in the high-lying bed across the table. Richard loves me, she muttered, he will not let any harm come to me. Rebecca tried to believe in her firm, passionate utterance, but the image of the monstrous woman kept flashing across her mind. Frustrated and fatigued, Rebecca grabbed her white flowery nightdress and pulled as hard as she could. Her teeth were gritted and her eyes were dilated. Rebecca was breathing heavily as she pulled, flirting momentarily with insanity. Pulling her nightdress made her feel better. It felt like her own way of ditching out the violence and trauma she had faced repeatedly in her home. Tears started dropping down from her eyes. Thankfully, she didn't have to hold on to any negative thoughts at the moment. Her mind was blank and peaceful. After a while, she fell back down in the bed, laying face up and staring at the ceiling. Silence continued to permeate her mind. The bedroom door clicked open, forcing her to sit upright. There was a hint of fascination in the way she looked at the sinewy figure of Richard, who refused to look towards her. Richard dropped his suitcase on the table, took off his black suit, and started to untie his black tie. Rebecca moved from the bed with the alacrity and enthusiasm of a child. Dashing towards him was met with a resentment that froze her. Richard had a humbling look of exquisite disdain. His lips were parted as if he intended to whisper something. His nose was tightened as if he was holding his breath. His eyes were slightly dilated and unblinkingly fixed at her. What? Is there something wrong? Rebecca asked. Richard took off his tie without taking his gaze from her. Talk to me, honey, Rebecca said. What do you want me to say? Why are you still here? Richard barked, startling her. Rebecca reeled backward almost tipping herself over. You didn't sound like you really meant it, right? Rebecca said in the softest voice she could muster. What do you mean? Why do you keep behaving like a child? You know what I want and you know you cannot give it to me. Stop pretending, Rebecca. Stop behaving like a child. You know this cannot continue. I don't know. You didn't even call me by my name a month ago. I don't understand this sudden change, honey. Stop calling me that. I'm not your honey. I don't want to be your honey. I don't want to be sweet to you. 
Do you think you're sweet to me? I find myself becoming more miserable every night I wake up beside you. Why are you trying to hurt me so bad? She asked. You can't have a baby, Rebecca. The doctor said that. I want a baby. You know that, Richard said angrily. That was more than a year ago. We talked about this. You said you didn't mind. You said you just wanted me, Rebecca said, tears welling up in her eyes. She tried to grab the cuff of his shirt, but Richard slapped off her hand and bit hard on his bottom lip. The slap was painful and left a red line across her forearm. Rebecca took a quick look at her forearm, trembling in her breath and feeling a weakness in her knees. She grew paler and looked like she was going to pass out any moment. Don't give me that look, Rebecca. I've had enough. And you know it. Richard's voice was tired and soft this time. It expressed his frustration and annoyance. It had an air of pity and regret. This was not what you told me, Richard. You told me you'd protect me. You told me you don't see anyone else in the picture. What happened to forever? Please don't start, Richard said, stroking his beard. Nothing lasts forever. Not even this world will last forever. Rebecca's lips trembled. Short of words, disenchanted, she struggled to thread through this impasse. This is over, Rebecca. You can't revive a dead horse by flogging it. No, Richard, please. Rebecca dropped down on her knees and grabbed his pants. What we have is not a dead horse. Don't use that bad analogy. Please don't. Don't you ever get tired of being dumb, Rebecca? The next sound was loud and sent a shiver up Rebecca's spine. Rebecca turned to the bedroom door and found the heavy-set frame of Sarah, her mother-in-law, the woman with a monstrous smile. Sarah was not smiling as she stood at the door. The jowls of flesh drooping down from her neck bobbled slightly, expressing disgust. Sarah moved towards them, tramping her foot like a medieval soldier on a mission to end the revolt of proletariats. When will you learn, Rebecca? Are you deliberately obtuse? Sarah asked. Rebecca opened her mouth to say something but quickly closed it back, unwilling to exchange words with a woman that had a track record of stirring pain with her lips. You don't have anything to say, huh? Sarah asked. I love Richard. You know that. Everyone knows that, Rebecca replied. Love? Sarah asked, clapping her hands theatrically. How can an infertile woman talk about love? Who would love you, Rebecca? Sarah asked, glaring at Rebecca. Rebecca looked up at Richard, expectant. Richard met her eyes briefly before looking away from her. Rebecca took her hands from his pants and stood up, confused, disturbed, and alone. Richard didn't have any problem with that. We talked about it. Why is this coming up now? Rebecca asked. Richard kept looking away from Rebecca, unwilling to entertain past promises. Maybe he loved you once. Love does stupid things to people. Maybe you were able to convince him to look beyond your inadequacies as a woman. But you forget one important fact. Rebecca, marriage is not just between two people. It is between two families. And we don't like that you can't have a baby, Rebecca. We don't want our son to spend the rest of his life with an infertile woman. Life is mostly about succession, and Richard's name is not going to die with you. Sarah captured the changes in Rebecca's expression as she spoke her mind. The tears welling up Rebecca's eyes strengthened her resolve to hurt her as much as possible. This is the end of the line, Rebecca, Sarah cut in, interrupting her. By the end of this night, you'll be out of this house. And don't even think you can get anything from us. My son owns nothing. This house and everything in it belongs to the family. So here's how it's going to be, Rebecca, Sarah said, drawing closer to Rebecca. I'm going to go downstairs and drink wine with some of our family members I brought along with me. I'll be giving you 20 minutes to take your things and leave the house. If I don't see you outside by 20 minutes, I'll come back to this room and throw you out. Do you understand me? Sarah asked, exuding a smile that firmly expressed her lack of empathy. Rebecca was speechless. She ran the back of her right hand across her eyes 
as if she would wake up from this terrible nightmare if she rubbed them long enough. When Rebecca took her hands from her eyes, Sarah was still smiling. Richard was still looking away from them. Are you not going to say anything? Rebecca asked, fixing her eyes on Richard. Richard was unresponsive. Instead, he started to unbutton his shirt. Your time starts now, Rebecca. Tick tock, Sarah said, turning away from her. Sarah walked to the door gallantly and quietly closed it on her way out. Rebecca took a deep breath and darted towards Richard. She placed her hands on his face. Look at me, Richard. Look at me. You told me this could happen. You told me your family preferred to form alliances with other rich families through marriage. But you promised to protect me. You promised to be on my side no matter what. You promised... That is in the past, Richard bawled and placed one hand on his face. But I told you at the time that I didn't mind us breaking up if you really wanted a baby. You told me not to worry about it. You gave me assurances, Rebecca responded sadly. Stop dwelling in the past, Richard said, looming his face down. For a moment it seemed he was engulfed in a mix of regret and shame. You said you're a man of your words, Rebecca replied desperately. Richard shook his head, stroking his beard nervously. You really are naive in matters of the heart, Rebecca. It is one of the most beautiful things about you. But life happens. People discover other sides of themselves. Life makes us hypocrites. I'm sorry, but there's no way I can see the two of us together anymore, Richard said, grabbing her hands. And just so you know, Rebecca, I have found someone else. Richard took an intense stare at her face, the tears trickling down from her eyes, the gentle tremble of her lips, before letting go of her hands. Please leave before my mum returns. You won't like her when she's really angry, Richard said, drifting away from her. Rebecca rubbed the back of her hand against her face again, desperate to wake up from the damning clarity of her marriage. Her eyes were bleary and sadness built webs across her mind. Rebecca received flashes of her time with Richard in college. The intensity of their romance, the purity of their love, the softness of their promises, the easy convergence of their dreams. She remembered the desperation with which other ladies yearned to be in her shoes. Rebecca managed a faint, sad smile as she became encapsulated in these memories. She dried her eyes in painful acceptance of the end of this phase of her life. Rebecca realised, sadly, that she had gone about her love life like a naive swimmer flapping her arms across shallow waters and oblivious of the haunting nearness of the deep. Rebecca saw suffering in most things, in the giggles of babies in strollers, in the hushed conversations of lovers by the roadside. Beautiful things reminded her of her ugly, painful past. Reality was harsh and left her wallowing in self-pity. She had been able to get a job as a receptionist in a small accounting firm. She was on minimum wage, and the manager had consistently made it clear that the workplace would be better if she could smile a little more. But what was there to smile about? Having lived in a duplex for the most part, Rebecca had become confined to a tiny room in Lincoln Heights, and the American dream had essentially become the American nightmare. Rebecca had a small book, where she documented most of her dreams, but she hadn't taken a look at that book since her divorce. She saw vanity before anything else. On this particular afternoon, after having a lunch of coffee and pastries, Rebecca ventured outside the cafe with her face swooped down. Hey, can you spare some change for lunch? A voice asked pleadingly. Rebecca looked up and found a tiny, scrawny man in front of her. The man had yellow teeth and his eyes looked half dead. Please, I haven't had a meal since yesterday afternoon. Rebecca instantly felt sorry for the man, who started to become emotional as he stood before her, and stretched one hand forward, pleadingly. Rebecca dipped one hand in her denim jean pocket and brought out a $10 note. Here, for lunch and dinner. I hope you're not going to spend it on alcohol, she asked handing the note to the man. No, no, I have been sober for some time. It just took me too long to wake up to my reality. 
the man said, scratching his tousled hair. I was comfortable once, all right, but I just couldn't shake off the pain, you know. I lost my wife and kids in a fire and never recovered. I lost our home and just couldn't go on with life, the man added. I'm so sorry about that, Rebecca responded. Please don't be sorry. I just realised that I disappointed them. They would have wanted me to live for them. I have started applying for jobs. I hope I get one. I hope I'm able to make a turnaround. I hope so too, Rebecca responded sadly. We need more people like you in the world, the man said. Why do you think so? Rebecca asked. I see you come and go from work. I spend the night close to that dump there, the man said, pointing to the dump at the side of the building where Rebecca worked. Rebecca was slightly uncomfortable and quickly dipped her hands in her pockets, staring defensively at the man. I gotta go, Rebecca said. I know you have dreams. I see it in your eyes, but I see pain too. But you must not let the pain win. You must not kill your dreams with sad thoughts. Please don't wake up too late like me, the man said, limping away in the gait of an old man. Rebecca watched him, emotionally. Tears formed in her eyes and she couldn't take her eyes off the man until he drifted away from her line of vision. It had taken five years for Rebecca to have a vivid mental capture of the moments leading up to her departure from her matrimonial home. She was standing before a bathroom mirror when it dawned on her that the wrinkles on her brow weren't as visible as they had been five years ago. The sullen brown lines underneath her eyes had faded away. Rebecca looked healthier, livelier, and more composed. There was no cup of tea in her hand, but there was a cup of coffee on her desk. She ran her hands through her auburn hair several times before tying it in a knot. Rebecca's hand trembled slightly as she received flashes of Sarah's compelling, heartless speech. She dropped a lid on this memory and proceeded to leave the bathroom. Rebecca had buried her mind in uplifting herself and establishing the dreams she had nurtured in college. She walked into a large, sprawling office and reached for the cup of coffee on her desk. There was a love symbol on the cup, and as she took a sip, Rebecca felt relaxed, accomplished, and content. She had a moment to skim through the screen of her laptop where Rebecca Enterprises was boldly written at the top of the screen. Before moving to the bathroom, Rebecca was looking through the previous month's sales and turnover of her company. Rebecca smiled and moved from the desk. She walked across the office to the glassed wall that had a panoramic view of Beverly Hills. Rebecca had a moment to watch the activities down the road. The people walking through the sidewalk looked small from up here, but Rebecca believed she would have looked smaller as she navigated her way towards the elevation she had now attained. Rebecca Enterprises was a conglomerate of several businesses, cutting through fashion, skincare, and real estate. Rebecca ran the back of her right hand across her eyes, smiling as she met the glassed window after opening them. Incidentally, a soft knock came on the door, a bespectacled lady holding a file in one hand and a bouquet in the other, walked into the office. She exuded a pleasant smile as she walked towards Rebecca. Why are you smiling so much, Linda? Rebecca asked. The bouquet smells really nice, Linda responded, handing the bouquet to Rebecca. Rebecca inhaled deeply and lost her smile. It was a weird reaction that startled Linda, who quickly adjusted her glasses and took a step backward. Is there a problem? Linda asked. Who is it from? Rebecca asked. Linda pointed to the note attached to the vase. Rebecca took out the note quickly and found a short message. I have lots of businesses to take care of today, but thinking about you has dominated my mind. I can't help it. We should go out on a date, Rebecca. Please give me a call. Jacob Langston. Rebecca shook her head and dropped the note back in the vase. Jacob Langston, Rebecca muttered. He's quite big in real estate, Linda responded. Does it matter? Linda pressed her lips together, dropping her face slightly. I don't mean to be rude, but these men wouldn't have looked my way if I hadn't achieved what I've achieved, Rebecca added. Do you want to hear what I think? Linda asked. Of course. 
It's not every time someone sends a bouquet in a vase. I think it's really thoughtful. Well, Linda, men understand thoughtfulness and romance at the beginning of a relationship. They always know the right way to treat a woman until they get her. He could be different. None of the other men sent flowers in a vase. Rebecca shook her head disapprovingly. She took a sip of coffee and walked towards her desk. She slouched against her desk, holding out the cup of coffee thoughtfully. Linda gelled with the prevailing silence, embracing the file as she allowed Rebecca to have her moment. You know I was once looking at a partnership with Jacob in real estate. You know what I found out about him? Linda drew closer to Rebecca interestedly. Tell me everything. He has been married three times. Damn. See, I bet he sent bouquets to all those ladies at one point. His third marriage only lasted three months. That's really bad, Linda responded, tapping her head with her forefinger. But he may not be at fault, you know. People can really be unlucky. Maybe he's one of those unlucky men. He doesn't strike me as one, to be honest. He looks more like an opportunist. Some men just want to insert themselves in the story of successful women. That's harsh. But it's true, Linda. I have seen so much to know that romantic men can be the most manipulative. They know the right gestures because they've done it over and over again. Linda's eyes dilated slightly. She took a quick breath, held down the file, and lost the air of vigor on her face. What really happened to you, ma'am? You have never had a positive look at romantic gestures. Rebecca feigned a smile and interlocked her fingers, tilting her face up slightly. You really don't want to hear my story, Linda. You are a young woman. I think you have the right to experience men for yourself. Maybe your experience will be different. Rebecca handed the vase back to Linda. What do you want me to do with it? I don't know. You can put it on your desk. I'm sure it'd look beautiful right there. You are not going to give him a chance, are you? I'm going to send him a diplomatic message. Diplomatic? Forget about it. Is there anything else? Rebecca asked, wearing a business look. Yeah, we've booked the rooms and we're set for Park City. Do you think that's a great location for team bonding? It's winter and I love skiing. Rebecca pressed her lips together, exuding a suppressed smile. She dropped her cup of coffee on the table and folded her arms around her stomach. This file came in today, Linda said, handing the file to Rebecca. Rebecca quickly flipped through the file and handed it back to Linda. Like every acquisition, every prospective seller proves hard to get initially. Send it to the negotiation and research team. Let them tell me what they think. Linda took the file and left the office. Rebecca drifted back to the glassed wall and resumed her observation of the traffic along the road in her line of vision. For a moment, Rebecca was lost in this observation. She took note of some of the unique fashion statements of the passers-by, nodding as every observation seemed to ignite her creative impulse. Moments later, Rebecca was rubbing her hands together and wearing a sober, serious look. She cocked her head sideways as she tried to fine-tune a mental image of a design that came to her mind. Rebecca had an innovation and research team responsible for devising fresh and catchy Gen Z fashion templates, but she frequently chipped in her own ideas. Rebecca's fashion company was strategically focused on meeting the taste and preferences of the younger generation. Rebecca was jerked off her mind by a knock on her office door. She turned quickly to the door, exuding a serious look. Linda walked inside the office, stopping two yards from the doorway. She was holding another bouquet. This one just came in for you, Linda said in a hushed, nervy voice. It smells really good, too. Rebecca walked across to the door and stared intensely at the pink roses. She took the bouquet from Linda and took a quick sniff. Rebecca liked the smell of this one. She took another quick sniff and took out the note that came with it. Hello, Rebecca. I have been fascinated by your approach and philosophy to life. 
You stimulate my brain as much as you stimulate my heart. I'm not sure I have felt anything as pure as this. If it's not too much, can you have dinner with me at the swing? I have made reservations for Friday. Does 9pm sound great? Give me a call. Tim Lake. Rebecca was smiling as she read this note. Linda was infected by her smile and smiled with her. Rebecca took another sniff from the bouquet after she had finished reading the note. You like this one? Linda asked. Tim is young, vibrant, and knows how to give a good speech. I can't afford to be fooled by him. Maybe he's sincere. Maybe, but he's really too young and has a lot to gain from associating with me. What if it's just true love? Young people easily find older women attractive. That is not something I'd really like to try at this point in my life. For a moment, I thought you liked him. I like him, but I don't see a relationship with him. Maybe going on a date with him might change your mind. I actually don't need a date with him. I know what I see, and it's not what I'm looking for. Linda took a deep breath, shook her head, and turned towards the door. She turned around quickly. Am I taking this bouquet to my office, too? No, don't worry about this one. I'll keep it. Rebecca said, smiling softly. Aesthetically, the town of Park City retained much of its 19th century charm. There were obvious traces of its western mining charm, and in winter, Deer Valley offered skiers a playground for the gods. Stuck in a cloud of snow, Rebecca struggled to move her legs. Her fall had been sudden and painful. She examined her body carefully and nervously. Rebecca hadn't broken any bone, but pain throbbed through her right ankle. When she tried to stand upright, she gnashed her teeth, unable to stave off the pain. Rebecca knew that she would struggle to walk back to the entrance of the resort in her current condition. Unfortunately, the staff she had brought along with her were all ahead of her. Rebecca tried to take a few forward steps, but continued to struggle. She thought about strapping her ankle tightly to cushion the pain. Rebecca had seen a few thrilling movies where persevering characters opted for this measure. Nonetheless, Rebecca had no idea how to go about it. This situation and the associated cold exposed the loneliness she had hidden in her workaholic routine and contentment. Rebecca reached for her phone in her tracksuit. Unfortunately, her battery was dead. She was unnerved by this realisation. It brought haunting thoughts of dying in abandonment. Rebecca found herself staving into horrid imaginations about how such abandonment could splinter to a very horrible experience. She thought about wolves, wild animals. She thought about being eaten alive as she screamed in pain. Rebecca dipped her forefingers in her ears in a desperate attempt to shut out these thoughts. She tried to stand upright, but the pain had become worse. Her feet were numb and felt like they had lost their sense of purpose. Rebecca bit hard on her bottom lip and took another step forward. She screamed loudly, gnashing in pain. Help! she hollered. Her voice was eaten up by the gust of wind that flew past her. Rebecca looked over her shoulder, scanning her environment. Inadvertently, the thoughts of being eaten alive by a wild animal started to creep up her mind again. Help! Somebody help! Her voice sounded very low in the gusting, terrible wind. It started to dawn on her that she had chosen the wrong day to visit Deer Valley. Nonetheless, Rebecca believed that if she could manage a few forward steps, she might run into some of the local guides spread across the valley. She dropped down on the ground and started to creep. She crept as fast as she could, dragging her feet and breathing heavily in the wind. Moments later, Rebecca felt a touch on her back. Help! she screamed, imagining the worst. The rush of fear from the unexpected touch compelled her to fall face down. Rebecca felt that a wild animal had truly crept up behind her. Are you okay? The voice had a baritone, helpful quality that instantly doused the fear that pervaded her mind. She turned around and found a man staring down at her. This was a tall, clean-shaven man, imbued with chiseled jawline and high cheekbones. He had an inquisitive, 
interested look about him. Are you okay? he repeated. I can't walk. My ankles are killing me. The man stretched one hand towards her. Rebecca took his hand and instantly felt the immense strength of the man. He pulled her up and lifted her on his shoulder. Rebecca was slightly weirded out by the ease with which he lifted her up, but she was occupied by the fascination that afflicted her after taking a closer look at his face. His grey eyes and soft, small lips spoke tales of hardened gentility and exquisite beauty. Despite the full weight of her body on his shoulder, the man was able to maintain a steady stride. Moments later, the stranger led Rebecca to a clinic outside Deer Valley. He attracted the stares of most of the passers-by, but he kept moving until he got to the emergency unit. He sat on a bench, clenching his hands as he watched a nurse attending to Rebecca. Most of the pain from Rebecca's ankle had already been doused by the impression she had of the stranger. Once the nurse gave them a bit of privacy, Rebecca turned to him. What's your name? Dominic, he replied. I'm Rebecca. Great, how's the ankle? It's still killing me, but thanks to you, I wouldn't be eaten alive by a wild animal. There's no wild animal there, Dominic responded. Rebecca took a deep breath. I'm really sorry to cut short your fun. I'm sure you have other things you've planned out for today. No, seriously, it's okay. I was getting a little bored, to be honest. If you want to make it up to me, maybe we could have dinner together, Dominic asked. That sounds great. I'll be at the Cosmic Valley from 7pm. It's usually great on Fridays, Dominic said, bringing out a jotter and a pen. He scribbled his phone number and tore out the sheet of paper. Here's my number in case you need to reach me for a description. Rebecca took the piece of paper from his hand without taking her eyes from his face. Incidentally, Linda stormed into the emergency unit. Thank goodness I was really worried, she said, hurrying towards Rebecca. She squatted and felt her bandaged ankle. What happened? Linda asked. I had an accident, Rebecca responded. My God, Linda said, standing upright. But he saved me, Rebecca added, pointing to Dominic. Dominic had a smile on his face as he met Linda's eyes. Thank you, Linda said, avoiding his eyes. I was told of a man that carried a lady on his shoulder to the clinic. That must have been you. I had to do what I had to do, Dominic responded. The nurse returned with drugs and spent the next moment explaining the prescription to Rebecca. Moments later, Dominic stood up and took a quick look at his timepiece. I have to leave now. I hope I'll see you by seven. Rebecca nodded with a smile. Moments later, Linda moved to the doorway, took a quick scan and returned to Rebecca. Did you see his eyes? Linda asked. Whose eyes? The man that rescued you. Dominic? That's his name. He sure looks like a Dominic. Strong, sexy, beautiful. Relax, Linda. Life is not a movie. I see something, Rebecca. I see something different. He looks at you the way my mom looks at lasagna. My mom loves lasagna so much. Everything looks like love to you, Linda. No, this is not like the others. I mean, the bouquets are beautiful, but this man just looks like... Linda tapped her head fervently in search of the right word. The one. He looks like the one. Where are you getting this from? His face, his look. Relax, Linda, Rebecca cut in seriously. Sometimes I'm really afraid of the way you easily see romance and positivity in most things. I think it is dangerous. A woman cannot afford to have a naive look on things. You'll learn the hard way if you're not careful. I believe... I don't know if that's naivety, but my conviction has taken me this far. Why should I abandon it now? Linda asked. I am not asking you to abandon it. You just have to be careful. There's nothing wrong in taking a second look or even a third look. First impressions are not enough. Dominic, Linda said thoughtfully, I will be there when it happens. And I'll remind you of today. When what happens? 
Rebecca asked confusedly. Your marriage with Dominic? Oh, for goodness sake, Linda. It's okay if you don't see it yet, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. Linda paused, pressed her lips together, and locked eyes with Rebecca. It is going to happen, Linda added. Rebecca shook her head, captivated and worried about Linda's innocuous approach to life. If anything, Linda reminded her of her younger self. She reminded her of the way she blindly swam through life, believing that great things would automatically happen to her because she had a good heart. Only as Rebecca had figured out, it was ruthlessness and focus that had brought her this far. She knew she would have been rotting away in misery and disenchantment if she didn't change her perception of life. Unwilling to engage in any argument with Linda, Rebecca stretched her hand forward. Take me to my room. I really need some rest. Exuberantly, Linda took her hand and helped her up. Linda hummed a love song as she accompanied Rebecca to her car. Rebecca simply shook her head, wondering if there were any limitations to Linda's vigorous positivity. The night had the appearance of a mother close to tears and looking across the faces of her kids, who expected to hear her tell a story. Rebecca felt like one of those kids. She felt like the mother was close to tears because the story was going to be about her. Redemption, punishment. It was hard to tell the dimension of this story. Years of resoluteness were shredded slowly, and Rebecca felt the vulnerability of opening the pages of a book that left the biggest scar in her heart. She felt like a lie in her red dress and black-heeled shoes. She looked up at the night sky without any real thought. Only when she dropped her face, it felt like the sky had become a mirror. It brought back vivid images of her past. The promises of love, the promises of forever. Was this the story the night intended to tell? Rebecca pulled up at the Cosmic Valley and instantly felt the spirit of romance that lingered there. She felt the slaps of breeze, and they came to her like the exquisite caress of a passionate kiss. The holding of hands was prominent at the sprawling parking lot. The sound of giggles came to her like the appeals of children, oblivious of the tears trickling down the eyes of their mother. Rebecca couldn't understand how her heart translated the features of the night, sadly. She couldn't understand how she suddenly appealed to her emotions, like the prodigal son knocking hard at the gate of his rich father. Inside the restaurant, Rebecca met Dominic. He wore a black suit, taking a fashionable look to proceeding. It was refreshing to find that he had taken the date as seriously as she had. It was, after all, the first real date she was entertaining after many years. Dominic was holding a bouquet of red roses and had a cheerful smile that was easily unnoticeable in his striking gaze. He kept his eyes on hers, following every step she took towards him. To Rebecca, these steps felt like a victory and defeat. She knew she was opening her heart to the eternal highways of emotions, but the lingering air of heartbreak was not lost on her. Rebecca was only a foot away from Dominic before she truly jolted herself from her thoughts. She looked at his eyes and felt the light that oozed out of them. The small breeze that flew past them gave her the funny feeling that she had just kissed him in the simultaneous breath that followed. You are so beautiful in this dress, Rebecca. Thank you. Dominic pulled out a chair and waited for her to sit down before handing her the bouquet. I got this for you. Thank you, Rebecca said, taking a sniff. It smells so good. Instead of sitting across her chair, Dominic decided to sit beside her. At the flower shop, I was told I was making the 69th purchase of the day, Dominic said. Does it have any significance? Rebecca asked. I don't really know, but they say that is where all the pieces fit. Do you live in Park City? Rebecca asked. No, but this is my preferred spot whenever I feel like catching a bit of refreshment. Sometimes I stay for two days. Sometimes I stay for three days. Why this spot? I don't know, but it feels like living in a poem. Interesting. I had the same feeling this evening. 
Where do you live? Rebecca asked. New York, but I'll be moving to LA next month. Rebecca's eyes lit up. The appealing coincidences enthralled her. How's the ankle? he asked. Feels better, thank you. They locked eyes for a moment. Dominic retained the cheerful smile across his lips. Rebecca had a more serious, composed, business look. That is where all the pieces fit, Rebecca's mind's voice whispered. She looked away from him and down at the approaching frame of an attendant. The attendant had a smile on his face as if he was within earshot of her mind's deliberation. Moments later, Dominic was refilling her glass from a bottle of wine. The wine hadn't kicked in yet, but Rebecca had a lively, lovely countenance. Inadvertently, she let her guards down, taking the look of the college girl that made the easy move of marrying her boyfriend after graduation. Dominic couldn't take his eyes off her. Rebecca wondered why he hadn't asked her any question. You are so beautiful, Dominic complimented, interrupting her line of thought. Rebecca smiled and took another sip of wine. I'm flattered. Don't be. I'm just telling you the truth. Why are you moving to LA? Rebecca asked. Well, I am launching a lifestyle app with my best friend. We want the company to be headquartered in LA. We are trying to create something that appeals to all ages. That's kind of risky, isn't it? Especially if New York is your base of strength. Well, that's not how I see it. We have made and sold several fintech and social media companies. We are just trying to build our webs across the US. This is the one app we do not intend to sell. We want to keep it 50-50. Were the others outright sales? No, we have a 30% share in every company we've built. That's interesting. Swift was the last one we sold. Wait, you created Swift? Dominic smiled, nodding and taking a sip of wine. Impressed, Rebecca took out her phone and searched for Swift and Dominic. She kept smiling and nodding as she read through the results. She looked up at Dominic, who kept giving her a mesmerized look. Rebecca took a sip of wine and dropped the glass. The wine was starting to kick in. So what's a handsome guy like you doing alone in Park City? I believe I can ask you the same question, Dominic responded. Rebecca giggled and shook her head, sadly. You don't want to hear my story. Well, I can start with telling you mine if you don't mind, Dominic replied. Rebecca cocked her head one way, becoming increasingly immersed in the allures of wine. I'm all ears. I lost my wife two years ago. I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. She had cancer, but I made sure I gave her the time of her life before she left this world, Dominic said, taking a sip of wine. He sat up, distracted by the approaching presence of another attendant. This one was wielding a small tray of smoking beefsteaks. This is where I had the most tasty steak, Dominic said preparing Rebecca's palate for it. Rebecca was more interested in his story, but she played along, impaling a piece of steak and helping it into her mouth. She nodded as she chewed. This is really delicious, she remarked. I told you. Moments later, Rebecca lost the effect of the wine on her senses and mood. The steak had greatly helped in this regard. You know, my late wife suggested Park City. She said she always wanted to come here. And we really had a great time here. Rebecca's eyes constricted slightly. She hid her expression in the glass, managing another small sip. You know, her biggest regret was not having a child with me. But I loved her in a way that made me feel adequate. But I think I really said goodbye to her in Park City. So you've been single ever since? Rebecca asked. Yeah, it's not always easy to find the right piece. Dominic said, taking a glimpse at the bouquet at her side. How about you, Rebecca? Do you want to tell me about yourself? Your life? Well, I have been naive for most of my life. I married a man that didn't really want me. His family didn't want me. They accused me of being infertile and threw me out of my matrimonial home. That was the lowest point of my life, but I came back big, you know. It was the push I needed to be an established businesswoman. 
I love hearing stories of people turning ashes to gold, Dominic responded. The sound of music pervaded the restaurant, ushering in silence amongst the diners, who listened to the soft country song of the performing artist. You'll love this, Dominic whispered. While Rebecca was focused on the artist, listening intently to the lyrics of the song, Dominic was focused on her. His eyes were slightly open, enamoured with her. He looked from her lips to her nose, following the alignment of her face. At the end of the song, Rebecca turned to her side and met his eyes. Dominic was lost in thought, caught up in a mesmerism he couldn't resist. He was transfigured with ecstasy and didn't notice Rebecca's growing interest in him. The night and its compelling story became apparent to her. It was about the poetry of their alignment. Rebecca couldn't remember a time when a man regarded her with such desperate passion. Dominic suddenly looked like a kid that needed nurturing. Rebecca was drawn to the look on his face, almost intoxicated by it. When Dominic shook off this look, managing a ponderous smile and sneaking a drink, Rebecca felt a tinge of sadness purring through her heart. She was enamoured with the helplessness and vulnerability that defined that look. And in that instant, she had the vivid perception that this was what she had always looked out for. But for how long, she wondered. If the love that bound her to Richard could fade away and die, what guarantee did she have that Dominic wouldn't follow the same path? Did you love the song? he asked. Yeah, it was lovely. It was poetry. In 30 minutes, there will be another one. Maybe we can listen to it before we leave. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Their eyes were locked as they spoke to each other, and their faces stood at whispering distance from each other. It was intense, attracting the gazes of a few people. In that moment, they thought about the same things, about the rain of kisses after a long drought, about the unification of dreams and second chances. When are you leaving Park City? Dominic asked, whispering. Tomorrow night. We should go on another date tomorrow afternoon before you leave. I will take you to a wine guessing game. You get to taste wines from across the world, Dominic said exuberantly. Sounds like a good idea. When are you leaving? Tomorrow night. A great coincidence. Not really. I would have stayed one more day if you were willing to stay. I was supposed to leave tonight, but here I am with you. So this is really the 69th purchase at that flower shop? She asked. Are all the pieces fitting? He asked. She exuded a dimpled, broad smile. The glint in her brown eyes were already married to the light in his grey eyes. Somehow, they made simultaneous responses, inadvertently. This has been worth it, Rebecca responded sincerely. A moment of silence came before them once again. This time, in Rebecca's eyes, the appearance of the mother around her children didn't look so gloomy. The story had been great, at least so far. Rebecca stretched out one hand and grazed his cheek tenderly. She had a flash of Linda's early celebration and smiled as she grazed his cheek again. The sound of music wafted up to them. They were supposed to listen to this song before leaving the restaurant, but Rebecca and Dominic didn't really care about the song right now. It had come too early. They still wanted to listen to the song blaring through their hearts. Dominic grabbed her hand and placed it firmly on his cheek, squeezing as he drew closer and closer to her. When the sound of applause permeated the restaurant, Dominic and Rebecca chuckled simultaneously. We missed the song, Rebecca said, giving off a broad smile. Did we really miss it? Dominic asked, stroking her hair gently. Rebecca's eyes were constricted as she felt his touches on her hair. She entertained vivid imaginations that connected her to the spirit she had lost with her previous marriage. The pictures in this room told tales of love, perseverance, trust, and resurrection. Rebecca was in this room, donned in a fashionable all-grey suit and a white camisole top. She took gentle sips of coffee from her cup that had a love symbol adorned on it. She drew closer to the wall, 
checking out a picture of her and Dominic. Rebecca wore a white wedding dress and stretched out her diamond ring. It was the smile on her face that particularly caught her attention. She was at the happiest point of her life. And as she looked at the picture intently, she found that her eyes were wet with tears. At her side, Dominic gave her the look that left her mesmerised at the Cosmic Valley. It had been 15 years since their grand wedding, but somehow it still felt like yesterday. Before she met Dominic, she had the mistaken notion that the first to love was usually the first to leave, but somehow Dominic remained and fanned the flames of their love with the intensity of a rising sun at dawn. She wheeled her gaze to another picture at the wall. Dominic was sitting beside her, and they both had a baby in between them. Rebecca grazed the face of the baby, allowing tears to dribble down her eyes as she deliberated on the curses and affliction the arrival of this baby had erased from her life. Rebecca was supposed to be infertile, but science had answers that superstitions struggled to comprehend. She backed away from the wall, emotional as could be. This room was the museum of her happiness. It was what Rebecca called it, and whenever she had an impending big event, she usually took her time to immerse herself in the memories spread across the room. Remembering her past and marrying it to her present always created room for her to count her blessings. Rebecca left the Museum of Happiness and ventured into another room. She stood at the doorway and watched as her maid tended to her five-year-old son. Alfred, she whispered. Alfred had his eyes on the mirror and didn't turn towards her. As Rebecca took a few steps, Alfred turned to the door, brightening up his face with a smile. Mum, he said in a hushed tone and darted towards her. Rebecca squatted and gave him a tight embrace, caressing his blonde hair before leaving a kiss on his cheek. Rebecca took a quick look through the room. Alfred had a trophy cabinet festooned with throngs of trophies he had won from different chess competitions. They called him a prodigy because it was impossible to go up against the adults he had defeated at such a tender age. Alfred's exploits had, of course, made him an instant celebrity, but Rebecca was managing his celebrity status as best as she could. She wanted Alfred to experience childhood and the blessings that came with it. Are you ready for today? Rebecca asked. Yes, Mum. Are you sure? The venue will be filled up. As much as they want to listen to me, everyone wants to see you too. I don't care as long as I'm with my mom, he replied. Rebecca left a kiss on his forehead and caressed his blonde hair. Moments later, Rebecca drove with Alfred to Monterey Hills. As president of the National Association of Realtors, Rebecca was hosting the annual party in this venue. There were several paparazzi outside the building. The sound of clicking cameras pervaded the ambience as Rebecca alighted with Alfred. Alfred held on tightly to her hand, disregarding the calls of the paparazzi. Rebecca wore dark glasses, keeping her head up as she walked gallantly to the door of the venue. Dominic bracketed them a measured distance from the stretching doors of the venue. He left a kiss on Rebecca's cheek and picked Alfred from the floor, giving him a warm embrace. I wanted to be as early as possible, Dominic said softly. Inside the building, Rebecca walked towards a steward, helping herself to a glass of champagne from his tray. As she snuck a sip of champagne, Rebecca took another look at the steward, unnerved slightly by his presence. The steward's mouth was agape, shocked by Rebecca's aura and presence. Rebecca! Richard! Richard had a look that expressed years of suppressed misery. Although he looked neat and dapper in his steward uniform, he had grown leaner and older. His face was tiny, swallowed by his overlapping beard. His eyes were red, and he had lost the shine in his skin. Rebecca gave him a piteous look as she made these observations. What happened to you? she asked. It is a long story. My family went bankrupt. We lost everything. My mum died last year. I'm ashamed to talk about how she died, Richard said, taking a deep breath 
and staving off the impulse to resort to tears. He sniffled and kept his face down for a moment, steeling himself. Look at you. You have the world at your feet. I didn't know you were the Rebecca they talked about. I didn't know you could... You always looked down on me, even though I gave you the best part of my life. I don't know how to put this to you, Rebecca, but I think everything started to fall apart after you left. I think we were cursed because of the way we treated you. Don't make your sufferings about me, Richard. You were always on a ticking time bomb. The world is full of people that have gotten away with making others suffer. Even the evil ones get more success than the good ones. Don't make your plight about me. I'm sorry. I just felt like I lost something after you left. Don't patronise me, Richard. I still remember some of your words from that night. You called me naive. You tried to hurt me as much as you could. You didn't lose anything after I left, Rebecca said, taking a gulp of champagne. But to be honest, I think I lost something. I lost the shackles that held me bound. I became free. I faced my dreams and did things my own way. Mom. Rebecca turned to her left and met the approaching frame of Alfred. Alfred grabbed Rebecca's hand. Dad is waiting for you at the table, Alfred remarked. This is your son. Alfred is your son, Richard asked with dilated eyes. Science gave the infertile woman another chance. God, I play chess and Alfred is really incredible. Can I get an autograph? Alfred is not allowed to give autographs for now. Okay, I understand, Richard said, sniffling. He stared intently at Rebecca's eyes, searching for a trace of the woman that married him. Only Rebecca remained coordinated and took a business look to proceeding. You are different. You are stronger than ever, Richard remarked. I could either have been miserable or strong. I chose strength. I'm so sorry, Rebecca. I'm so sorry for the way my family and I treated you. You didn't deserve it. I know it's going to be difficult, but can you forgive me? Forgiveness is beautiful, Richard. It is funny you think I'd stand here and have a conversation with you if I hadn't already forgiven you. You have? Richard asked, shocked. I wouldn't be here if I didn't suffer in your hands. Maybe I'd be here, but I'm not sure it would have been as fulfilling. I have forgiven you, Richard. I had forgiven you the day I realised that loving you wasn't the problem. I realised that I took your red flags for granted because I loved you. That was the problem. At least now I can tell people that falling in love with a person is not enough reason to go into a relationship with them. You really are different, Richard said emotionally. Alfred squeezed his hand tightly on Rebecca's fingers. Just so you know, I knew you were employed to serve at this party. I granted it. Although you used an old picture for your application, I'm not really surprised to see you, Rebecca said, seriously. Have a great time, she added, and walked away with Alfred. Rebecca made her way to her table, receiving a kiss from Dominic as she sat down. She looked into his eyes, capturing the passion embedded in his gaze. There was no hint that he was going to subdue the intensity with which he loved her. Was this what true love entailed? Was she lucky? Was Dominic life's compensation for the agony she received in her previous marriage? She snuck a sip of champagne as she locked eyes with him. Perhaps she was already on the interminable highways of heaven, where angels bowed to love's thrilling melodies inexorably. Rebecca was, at once, satisfied, joyous, and deepened in a mesmerism that she couldn't resist.